not just vaccines, but other tools and commodities. We urge the Secretariat to work closely with the regional offices and formations to ensure the implementation of this resolution. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, South Africa. I now give the floor to Sudan to be followed by Madagascar. Thank you. Esteemed Chair, members of the Health Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, we thank the DG for the reports on WHO's work on health emergencies and mental health preparedness for and, uh, for and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're committed to strengthening emergency preparedness and response and to solicit WHO's continued support in several areas, including the mental health and well-being in societies impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The demands of health emergencies continue to expand and associated with that, mental health consequences are also more evident. In addition to the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that the WHO is currently responding to 65 emergencies from all hazards across the globe, 15 of which are in the Eastern Mediterranean region. This is one of the most emergency-prone regions globally, where over 100 million people across the region currently require humanitarian assistance, 43% of the globe total. Within the region, progress is being made in professionalizing the management of health emergencies through a comprehensive approach of prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. This progress has been best reflected in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are many other examples also, such as the rapid and effective response to the port uh, explosion in Beirut last August. Nonetheless, more work is required, especially in the area of preparedness and strengthening IHR core capacities. The lessons learned from the COVID and the major reports presented today will inform the further strengthening of our overall health emergency management capacities. Special attention must be paid to the protracted humanitarian crisis, where we consistently observe a convergence of humanitarian and health security priorities. We encourage the consistent application of the humanitarian development peace nexus in such settings. The mental health dimension of emergencies also require far more committed attention. This is no better reflected than by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is having on the mental health and well-being of whole societies. We make a strong and clear commitment to integrating mental health fully into the preparedness, response and recovery plans for the COVID-19 pandemic. But this commitment must go beyond the pandemic. Mental health and psychological consequences are evident in all emergencies. We must more consistently apply the tools and approaches to supporting people's mental health and well-being when crises hit at all time. This will support the resilience of individuals, families and communities. Now more than ever, the global community must remain focused on accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development and the humanitarian agendas. Addressing the issue of mental health is critical to achieve the related goals. As we heed the advice of making greater investments in health emergency preparedness, we must ensure those investments also support mental health and well-being. Thank you, Chair, for your time. Thank you, Sudan. I now give the floor to Madagascar to be followed by Mexico. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, dear ministers, dear delegates, Madagascar is very pleased to give its statement on universal health care and the pandemic of COVID-19. And we align ourselves with the statement made by the representative that made their statement on behalf of Afro. All people have been affected by COVID-19 around the world, especially in Madagascar. And in 2015, we have started to see some epidemics arise in Madagascar. Governments during health emergencies have carried out emergency actions. However, their means are very limited. Countries, as well as the international community, have to work hand in hand. The risk is having an approach that is too limited and that privileges only short-term interest and that opposes health security and universal health coverage. Therefore, we need to adopt very clear public funding policies for health needs. 
Universal health coverage and health emergencies are closely linked. We shouldn't choose one or the other. We have to understand the actions that are necessary in terms of services in health care. We also need to make sure that we understand what is necessary in terms of governance and funding. We need to guarantee sufficient funding for public health goods as well as the public health functions. We need to make sure that we have laboratories, data systems in place, information systems in place, regulations, and we also have to carry out public health awareness campaigns. We have noticed that in many different countries, funding for these types of activities is not guaranteed. We need to find a solution to this to be able to reinforce these mechanisms that are activated when there are health emergencies. We also need to have routine health care uh, treatments and uh, medical products available at all times. We need to work with our technical and financial partners, and this uh, can be spearheaded by the WHO. We hope that uh, we are now laying the basis for a solid foundation for healthcare systems that are better prepared for the future, especially when it comes to uh, emergency situations. We need to make sure that uh, public health resources are increased, uh, especially those that are provided to us uh, by donors. This will help us deal with uh, uh, public health emergencies such as new infections when they crop up in our countries. We must prioritize uh, the budget that is allocated to health emergencies. Likewise, we should also institute new mechanisms of uh, coordination to make sure that the funds are fairly allocated for a, a proper response. Madam Chair, we would like to appeal to international solidarity to continue working together against this pandemic and to be able to face uh, national health emergencies that arise in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Madagascar. I now give the floor to Mexico to be followed by Peru. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Good morning. Good morning from Mexico. We would like to greet the presidency of the World Health Assembly that is leading this segment, as well as all the experts of member states that are represented here today in our session. Ladies and gentlemen, in Mexico, just as in other countries, the pandemic due to COVID-19 transformed our way of interacting with people that require mental health uh, attention, especially due to social distancing measures. As the pandemic wore on, more and more people required psychological treatment or psych psychiatric treatment, which was the case of healthcare personnel that are on the front lines. Also, children and adolescents needed to adapt themselves to dram dramatically to another reality. There were professors that had to find new resources to be able to uh, continue with their careers. Families saw themselves very far away from each other, and there was also an increase in violence, there was the loss of relatives, and there were many other situations that we had to deal with in Mexico. In this context, our government has carried out several different activities. One of the activities was adopting the mental health strategy during COVID-19. Its objective is to coordinate activities that are inter-institutional inter to provide uh, people suffering with mental health disorders treatment and help. This was done in the different phases, different waves of COVID-19. Amongst the main activities that were carried out and that are continuing are the following. We had many different workshops and courses that were uh, directed towards healthcare personnel, paramedics, students, children, people living in situations of vulnerability, and the public in general. We also had a campaign that was launched on social networks on the prevention of risk factors. We spoke, for example, during these campaigns about psychological effects of having to do with staying at home for a very long time, problems linked to living together in small spaces. We 
we raised awareness on the acts of violence, the increase in the consumption of substances, as well as strategies to deal with all of this, such as the strategies to reduce stress or to provide emotional support. We also published uh, many different leaflets on mental health and on psychosocial support that were available in psychiatric hospitals. We also put together uh, plans in terms of psychiatric help. There were training sessions on mental health. There were first aid sessions that were really focused on psychological assistance and interventions during times of psychological crises. We worked with the community centers of mental health, psychiatric hospitals, the state departments that deal with addictions, primary health care centers that are to do with addiction. And this was throughout the country. With the help of civil society organizations, we were able to provide consultations on mental health. We were able to provide psychological first aid, uh, interventions during crises, uh, counseling sessions, uh, also therapy sessions due to the loss of relatives. Uh, all of this is added to the hotlines that we implemented, as well as the social networks that we set up to help people get in touch uh, with the therapeutic centers uh, that help them with the psychological support. And this was done 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. To also be able to deal with mental health con uh, problems in COVID, we had the first fair of mental health in Latin America and the Caribbean in Mexico. And this was meant for Mexicans that were living in countries in the region. We are also working with health care authorities in Italy to implement uh, health care, joint health care services, and this will be done remotely. I would also like to highlight that we are continuing on the national strategy for the prevention of addictions, which is called Together in Peace. The objective of this campaign is to have an impact on the biopsychosocial determinants that will reduce the use of uh, psychoactive substances in children. And this will help with the construction of peace and will also help with promoting and protecting human rights. And this will uh, decrease the gap that exists in um, attention that is given to mental health and treatment that is given to mental health. Dear authorities and delegates, these are so only some of the examples of the activities that we have been able to carry out to improve mental health and addictions in the context of COVID-19 in Mexico. We would like to know more about the successful experiences that you have had uh, in other countries to be able to undertake them in our country as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mexico. I now give the floor to Peru to be followed by Tunisia. Hello? Oh. Peru, Peru, we can hear you. Please begin your intervention. Do you see me? You, do you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you and see you. You may now begin. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We would like to express the recognition of Peru to those who are fighting on the front lines every single day against this pandemic of COVID-19. We would also like to express our solidarity with those who have lost loved ones and those who have been affected by COVID-19. The sluggishness of the response of COVID-19 highlights the lack of global preparation, which has led to a multidimensional crisis that endangers the sustainability of many of the achievements that we have realized in the past. There is a deep inequality that we have seen in the access and distribution of vaccinations at COVID-19. And this shows at what point international solidarity and cooperation is so necessary. And for now, it has not, words have not yet been joined to actions. There is still an incredible inequality in access. It is fundamental that we change this and we do not repeat the same mistakes in the future. And crisis such as this one requires a global response. We must take action. 
To do so, we support the creation of a draft resolution that would create a working group on strengthening preparedness and the WHO's response in emergency situations. This would help us assess the recommendations of different mechanisms of response to COVID-19, such as the IPPBR, the Review Committee of the IHR, and the IOAC. Peru welcomes the presentation of all the reports of these mechanisms, and we express our commitment to work in a constructive way during this the work of the working group to analyze all of these recommendations. We hope to be able to identify concrete actions that will allow us to work together and to put into action multilateral efforts. We hope to also be able to implement IHR adequately. Likewise, Peru expresses its co-sponsorship to the draft decision to convene an extraordinary meeting of this during this assembly to consider the setting up of an international instrument on preparedness and responses during pandemics. Dear Madam Chair, our commitment to multilateralism has become a reality through our participation in the COVAX facility mechanism. To be able to provide equitable access to vaccinations, it is necessary to visibilize and deal with the situation that low middle income countries uh, face. A simple global division between countries that are high income and low income, on the other hand, is hides the enormous and urgent challenges that countries such as Peru face in terms of access and distribution of vaccines, treatment, in particular oxygen, diagnostics, and PPE. A true global response has to start from the recognition that vaccines and other tools are really public health goods. Peru will continue supporting the strengthening of multilateralism and of the WHO, as well as all the efforts that have been undertaken to reinforce global, regional, and national capacities in terms of preparedness and response to emergency situations and future pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peru. We will now go to Tunisia to be followed by Thailand. I understand that Thailand has a video. Donc, uh, Madame la Présidente. Madam President, Excellencies, colleagues, Tunisia fully aligns itself with the recommendations and uh, WHO conventions, and we would like to say that the arrival of the COVID-19 epidemic in our country as of March 2020 demonstrated the significant demand for mental health care among our population, but also among health care personnel. And this was the reason for the strong mobilization of carers working in the area of mental health and for the establishment of a free psychological support platform led by the Ministry of Health's Psychological Assistance Unit with a collaboration of private volunteers, medical students, psychologists, private psychiatr psychiatrists, as well as non-governmental associations. Recent events have confirmed the increase in psychological suffering and the significant emotional impact of the pandemic with the possibility of emerging mental disorders. In this context, the Ministry of Health has implemented psychological assistance units for healthcare staff among different health care structures at a second and third country level in order to provide them with close support and a better psychological treatment. These units will be made available in a second phase to cater to the needs of the general population. Each of these units comprises a doctor trained in psychological support and or one or several psychologists. In a number of regions where the availability of public psychiatrists is not guaranteed, private psychiatrists and psychologists have volunteered within these units and the goal of such units is to recognize the suffering of healthcare workers and to ensure early treatment and high quality support. As part of these efforts, these units ensure that a preventive role is carried out through psychoeducational work carried out uh, during awareness raising sessions and also screening activities take place to identify persons who are presenting uh, clinical manifestations of a pathological order and they also serve uh, as providing information in simple and accessible language 
on uh, health strategies and they also provide u useful telephone numbers and addresses to consult if necessary. Thank you, Tunisia. We will now go to the video from Thailand to be followed by the video from Georgia. Excellencies, I am speaking as a steering group chair of the Global Health Security Agenda. Addressing pandemics requires country capacities to prevent, prepare, detect, and respond. GHSA, a multilateral initiative of more than 70 countries and partners, strengthens country capacities to prepare for pandemics. GHSA reinforces achieving the goals of the international health regulations and other global health security frameworks. Hence, the GHSA strives to make the world safe from global health threats posed by infectious diseases. GHSA functions through its governing body, the steering group, chair, secretariat, permanent advisors, task forces, action packages, and contributing countries in implementing the 2024 framework. GHSA functions through the whole of government, multi-sectoral, and one health approaches at the country level. At the global level, as the United Nations General Assembly Resolution recognized the importance of global solidarity in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, GHSA confirms the importance of these cross-border multilateral efforts. Robust health security systems and universal access to prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and vaccines are keys for effective responses to pandemics why health system capacities can be maintained to sustain essential health services such as treatment and prevention of life-threatening diseases, notably those under the Sustainable Development Goals. Chair, Thailand hosted the 6th GHSA Ministerial Meeting where country leaders in global health security committed to intensify efforts in achieving the GHSA overarching target by applying the whole of government and whole of society approach. The multi-sectoral One Health approach would be enhanced. Surveillance and early warning systems would be strengthened. For more effective responses to the current and future pandemics, there would be more timely access to all relevant medical supplies. The environmental sector would be encouraged to fully engage with others at global and national levels. Ministers also reaffirm their commitment to enhance resilience of health systems through strengthening essential health services during pandemics must be maintained. Global solidarity is crucial for building country preparedness against global health security threats and the mitigation of impacts due to pandemics. As the chair of GHSA for this year, I reaffirm that GHSA will continue our commitment to strengthen country capacities to prevent, prepare, detect, and respond for global health security infectious disease threats. Thank you. Thank you, Thailand. I now give the floor to Georgia to be followed by the Republic of Moldova. Honorable Chair, Esteemed Director General, Distinguished Delegates, from the outset, I thank you, Director General, for presenting the report on implementation of the resolution WHA 73.1 on COVID-19 response. We much appreciate the World Health Organization's invaluable support rendered to Georgia in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. 
Despite huge efforts of the countries, the global pandemic is still in active phase and unfortunately, death toll is still high. It's noteworthy that new, more acute challenges are emerging during the pandemic, which complicates the management of the process. That's why our primary goal should be improving preparedness at national and the global levels, since we still do not know what kind of new challenges we will have to tackle. Time has a critical importance in terms of addressing challenges of the pandemic. We should be flexible and consistent while making decisions. First of all, we need to evaluate main gaps and outline prior needs, which will lead to the development of effective response mechanisms. To overcome pandemic challenges, it is essential to sustainably improve comprehensive mechanisms, such as active biosurveillance and epidemiological prognosis, as well as build capacities for diagnosis and treatment, and more importantly, enhance preventive measures. At the early stage of the pandemic, Our main tool against the spread of the virus was personal protective equipment, enhanced hygiene measures and social restrictions. Today we have vaccines, the main weapon to end the pandemic. Ensuring equitable access to COVID vaccines has a critical importance for all the countries. Also, it's essential to improve equitable access to all public health benefits that are key tools in combating pandemics. Georgia is a good example of transforming challenges into opportunities. Due to the urgent needs in the pandemic management process, country has taken important measures to improve the sustainability of healthcare system, including medical infrastructure, health personnel and clinical management capabilities. Besides completely new approaches and innovative technologies were introduced that have been endorsed by our international partners. However, despite all the achievements, new and difficult challenges are still ahead. With joint global resources, with equitable distribution of vaccines and with sharing best practices, we, without any doubt, will end the pandemic. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Georgia. I now give the floor to the video that is from the Republic of Moldova to be followed by Tonga. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic as the public health emergency of international concern have required implementing comprehensive public health measure and uh, mobilizing health and uh, non-health sector and whole society. The Republic of Moldova, in the context of COVID-19 response, have been working to strengthening health system capacity and to develop and maintain capacities in the point of entry. The IHR monitoring and evaluation performed by the country such as joint external evaluation, intra-action review assessment of the core capacity in the point of entry, along with the annual state party self-assessment annual reporting, allow to identify gaps and areas for improvement and is built on the strong intersectoral collaboration and involvement in IHR implementation. COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates that both comprehensive expert guided joint external evaluation and interaction review enable country to identify operational ways to manage the emergency by conducting periodic needs assessment, centralizing financing, mobilization and procurement system with sufficient flexibility, mobilizing and motivating human resources such as students and uh, residents as well as rapid relocation and repurposing of beds and facilities in response to the increased number of hospitalization and maintaining emergency medical services throughout the pandemic. Based on the assessment results and in line with WHO recommendation, medium and long-term strategic direction have been identified to strengthening emergency response and management such as revision and improvement of national legislation to approve the draft of the national action plan to strengthen the implementation of the IHR, the public health emergency preparedness and response plan for the health sector developed in 2020 based on the strategic risk assessment is to be tested in order to assure the health care with regards to emergency from one hand and uh, essential health services on the other hand. Strengthening of the core capacity in the point of entry to provide public health 
emergencies and the disease control activities, strengthening human resources through training in the field of emergency management, strengthening the surveillance system for communicable diseases and public health events, as well as the implementation of IT solution for data collection and exchanging. In the conclusion, I would like to express our gratitude for technical support on the evaluation conducted as well as the overall support in managing the COVID-19 pandemic and further strengthening of the public health emergency management. Thank you to the Republic of Moldova. We will now go to the video from Tonga to be followed by the video from Tuvalu. Honorable Chair, WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, Your Excellencies, Malo Elele from the Kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific. I am proud to say that Tonga is one of the few countries in the world to be still COVID free. As Honorable Prime Minister has addressed in the opening session, Tonga took immediate action starting in February 2020 and taking heed of WHO early warnings. We declared COVID-19 a national public health emergency in March 2020, worked on infrastructures to serve as quarantine and treatment centers, and established a new lab of, for PCR testing. We trained our health staff so that they would be ready to treat cases we engage with communities to improve prevention measures such as hand washing and physical distancing. And now we are working to vaccinate the population. And to date, we've reached more than 25% of our target population, including more than a thousand non-Tongan nationals. This is the kingdom's steadfast commitment to ethical, equitable access for vulnerable population, and of course, including our elderly, disabilities, and prisoners. This is all possible with powerful support and collaboration between all sectors of our society, as mighty support from the 100,000 local communities and islands. They are our heroes who have sacrificed during the pandemic and are still forging forward together with the Ministry of Health to save our micro population. Of course, none of this would have been possible without the support from the WHO. I echo the Kingdom's most sincere thanks to Vaito Hemoui Mapu Avaya, the Director General Dr. Tedros, Tongan name for his courageous ethical leadership, and Wipro Regional Director Dr. Takasi Kasai for inclusive and always keeping the Pacific Island countries on his radar. In addition, we have received technical and financial assistance from different development partners, including the Asian Development Bank, Pacific Community, World Bank, and the governments of Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and the United States of America, along with the support provided through those behind COVAX, such as the European Union. For this, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the Honorable Prime Minister and the Kingdom of Tonga, I would like to convey our most sincere gratitude to the brave leaders of the developed world and their commitment to equitable access of vaccines for the vulnerable Pacific Islands. Of course, the threat is far from over. The number of cases re recorded across the globe is still hitting the highest. Every day, there are thousands of deaf and people grieving behind each death, recognizing that the threat posed by COVID-19 is likely to continue, we need to remain vigilant, strengthen and upgrade systems, and ensure involvement of all sectors for coordinated whole of government, whole of society actions at national, subnational, and local levels. 
Thank you so much to Tonga. We will now go to the video from Tuvalu. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to give this statement on behalf of Tuvalu. Today, Tuvalu remains COVID-19 free. However, we continue to witness the devastating impacts of COVID-19 and emerging variants around the world. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those who have lost loved ones to this deadly virus. We applaud the continuous efforts of all health workers and response teams around the world. Tuvalu continues to strengthen our system to ensure the maximum protections of our citizens through mobilizing in multi-sectoral coordination through a national planning and response task force and subcommittees, improving public health, civilians and risk assessment, preparing our testing laboratory and health facilities, maintaining essential health services for our people, strengthening our infection prevention and control mechanisms, instituting non-pharmaceutical public health measures, and keeping our community informed through regular national press conference, radio, TV, and social media postings. We are grateful for the receipt of the WHO approved AstraZeneca vaccine from COVAX. Our health workers continue to administer the first dose of the vaccine, with the second dose to be administered after 10 to 12 weeks. The emergency of more COVID-19 variants is a wake-up call to develop and developing countries to hasten the developments and equitable distributions of safe COVID vaccines. Despite the huge challenges posed by COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, we continue to also focus our effort in managing non-communicable diseases as they are the leading cause of mortality in Tuvalu. Hence, strengthening Tuvalu's primary health care systems remain a priority, including updating and enforcing laws, regulations, and policies providing training for our teams, encourage our community, all efforts to reduce the burden of communicable disease and non-communicable disease. Tuvalu acknowledges the support of our response efforts from technical agency and development partners. These include the governments of Taiwan, so I take this opportunity to reaffirm Tuvalu's call, the inclusion of Taiwan in the World Health Assembly. Thank you to the World Health Organization for contributed to support, especially acknowledging the leaderships of Dr. Kasai. Lastly, as per the ECS theme, Tuvalu stands with you as the pandemic prevent the next and build together a healthier, safer, and fairer world. Faftailas, and God bless you all. Thank you, Tuvalu. There are no further requests from the floor, from member states, for item 17.1. We will now continue with the list of observers. In accordance with the rules applicable to observers at the World Health Assembly, I have the pleasure to give the floor to the representative of IFRC, to be followed by Gavi. Excellencies, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all young people with 90% reporting increased mental anxiety, more than 1 billion impacted by school closures, and one in six losing their jobs. A generation disrupted. This is why an alliance of the big six youth organizations composed by the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, World Organization of the Scouts Movement, World Young Women's Christian Association, World Young Men's Christian Association, the Duke of Edinburgh International Award, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts has joined forces with the WHO and UN Foundation to launch the global youth mobilization. Together, our big six organizations collectively support more than 250 million young people every year. The Global Youth Mobilization is a movement taking action to improve communities and young people's lives now in a post-COVID-19 world. We are investing more than $5 million in local and national youth organizations, including direct microfunding for youth-led solutions. 
In April, we organized a virtual global youth summit gathering over 14,000 young people from 152 countries in interactive sessions with over 50 partners. Following the summit, we are calling on governments, companies, and policymakers to support us to invest and scale up youth-led solutions and youth development programs across the world in response to the pandemic. The mobilization supports young people by equipping them with the skills for life, by providing safe spaces for their development and giving them the confidence to discover their potential and the challenges and challenge the status quo. We invite you to join by investing in young people, their ideas, their creativity and their talents. Thank you, IFRC. I now give the floor to the video from Gavi. COVID-19 has highlighted the severe inequities associated with access to vaccines to address a global pandemic. It has also highlighted the contribution of routine immunization and strong health systems to pandemic preparedness and response efforts. COVID-19's immense social consequences are felt in every community and every country on Earth and have caused an estimated 11.5 trillion US dollars in economic loss. COVAX is the only globally coordinated effort to guarantee fair, equitable and timely access to safe and efficacious vaccines. COVAX has delivered over 67 million doses to 124 economies globally. With more financing available, we can deliver 1.8 billion doses and protect 30% of population in AMC countries by 2022. Gavi calls upon member states to support COVAX by one, raising an additional 1.6 billion US dollars by June 2021 to deliver 1.8 billion doses by 2022. Two, sharing COVID-19 vaccines through COVAX. Three, removing trade barriers, export controls, and other transit issues to ensure distribution of COVID-19 vaccines and ingredients to those most in need. And four, support technology transfer and wrap up of manufacturing capacity to ensure equitable access. COVAX calls upon member states to include populations with a higher risk of developing severe COVID-19 symptoms and the most vulnerable, regardless of their legal, social and economic status, in COVID-19 national vaccination plans in line with the SAGE recommendations. And to maintain, restore and strengthen routine immunization, prioritize reaching zero-dose children and marginalized communities, including through greater focus on community engagement, to strengthen health security and pandemic preparedness, and to strengthen pathogen surveillance and reporting capacity to ensure high coverage of diagnostic services on a subnational level and timely detection of outbreaks. Thank you. Thank you to Gavi. I now give the floor to Colombia. Colombia, you have the floor. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We would like to thank the Secretariat for the update on the implementation of Resolution WHA 73.1 on the response to COVID-19. In this respect, we commend the efforts that have been undertaken by the organization to support a comprehensive response and effective response to the current COVID-19 pandemic that has turned the world upside down and that has a put our health systems to the test. We would especially like to thank countries that have helped us in the drafting of national preparedness and response plans. We hope to be able to continue with this support in this effective implementation of these plans of action. Currently, we are making great efforts to be able to alleviate the social and economic effects of this pandemic, and we have been tirelessly working to be able to find integrated solutions. In line with this, Act A is of special importance now because it represents a global push to find a quick exit out of this crisis. Colombia is committed to Act Accelerator, and we have committed ourselves to Act Accelerator not only with financial resources, but we have also participated through clinical trials. 
We have also participated and we have promoted the COVAX facility, which we see as a fundamental tool in terms of ensuring equitable access to vaccinations. Nevertheless, we are very aware of the current challenges that countries face when it comes to to the COVAX facility. There are many challenges with the COVAX facility. There are many low and middle income countries that are dealing with the low availability of vaccinations. And this is why we are making an urgent appeal to mobilize the necessary support that is needed for the COVAX facility. We hope that to countries with surpluses of vaccines will be able to fairly distribute them to all other countries. We also have to take into account the different demographic, social, and economic factors that have a direct impact on the situation of each country dealing with this pandemic. We are aware of the efforts that the organization has deployed to adapt its response to the current emergency without neglecting all the other strategic priorities of the global program of work. This balance will be necessary to be able to uh, fully attend to the challenges that remain in public health areas, as well as those that crop up because of emergencies. We need to really have a One Health approach. Lastly, we know that the organization requires the support and commitment at the political level, at the financial level, and technical level to deal with this current emergency and to strengthen its response for future emergencies. In line with this, we are making an appeal to countries to renew its com their commitments to the organization and to work hand-in-hand -hand with the WHO in strengthening the work of the WHO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colombia. There are no further requests for the floor from member states for item 17.1. In conformity with Rule 47 of the Rules of Procedure of the World Health Assembly concerning the representatives of the United Nations and of other intergovernmental organizations, I would now like to give the floor to UNFPA to be followed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Thank you, Madam President. UNFPA. Thank you, Madam President. UNFPA welcomes the report on the COVID-19 response by the Director General, outlining the challenges faced by women and girls, as well as health and social protection systems, which UNFPA is helping to address in over 150 countries. The pandemic has resulted in irreparable loss of hundreds of thousands of lives across the globe. It has put health systems in developed and developing countries under enormous stress. While priorities still and should continue to be concentrated on saving lives, UNFPA's latest data provides a stark picture of the broader impact COVID-19 pandemic is having on the rights, health and well-being of women and girls. UNFPA protects, projects the pandemic could result in millions of more cases of gender-based violence and unintended pregnancies. We have already seen setbacks in efforts aimed at preventing child marriage and female genital mutilation, as girls are no longer in schools and therefore more vulnerable to be married off or mutilated against their will. Essential sexual and reproductive health services have been limited as a result of containment measures and movement restrictions. Moreover, fears of contracting the virus in health centers are preventing women from seeking those services. Loss of income has limited access to service, medicines, and contraceptives. Furthermore, many healthcare providers working on sexual and reproductive health, for instance, midwives, have been redeployed to support the treatment and care of COVID-19 patients, but have not been prioritized in the distribution of personal protective equipment required for them to operate safely. Mindful that women represent 70% of the global health workforce, often performing tasks that place them at an increased risk to get infected and suffer burnout, UNFPA has been at the front line of supporting health workers, including the delivery of personal protective equipment. Moreover, we have been actively advocating with governments to ensure sexual reproductive services are an integral part of government's response plans. Some concrete measures have included the strengthening of health systems' capacity to deliver safe and quality services for pregnant and lactating mothers. Thank the you, remote UNFPA. delivery of services. Thank you, UNFPA. Your time has now elapsed. We now give the floor to IAEA to be followed by IOM. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the critical importance of international cooperation 
during a global crisis. The IA is proud to work with WHO and be part of the UN crisis management team. The IA has a long standing experience in assisting countries in tackling animal and zoonotic diseases such as avian influenza, Ebola, MERS, and Zika. In response to the COVID 19, the IA activated its biggest cooperation project in its history. With the support of member states, the IA has assisted 286 laboratories in 128 countries and territories around the world. The IA assistance included the provision of equipment and materials as well as technical advice and guidance to individual laboratories. The experience with the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the scientific and infrastructure gaps among countries to have a coordinated response to deal with the outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. Steaming from the IS long-standing experience and by the recognition that many countries still do not have the basic infrastructure to, to detect zoonotic diseases, the IS Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action Project, or ZODIAC, aims, among others, to enable countries to access to training, equipment, expertise for the implementation of detection and diagnostic techniques. Zodiac ultimately aims to enable laboratories to produce quality information for science-based decision-making by the country as well as the international community. The IA looks forward to continuing our close collaboration with all the stakeholders in this endeavor. Thank you to the IAEA. I now give the floor to IOM. Honorable Chair, Director General, distinguished delegates, while many have faced huge health and socioeconomic impacts from COVID-19, migrants and displaced populations have been especially vulnerable to the pandemic's consequences. In coordination with WHO and key partners, IOM has addressed the health needs of migrants, including internally displaced persons, as part of its overall COVID-19 strategic response and recovery efforts. For example, in 2020, more than 38,000 trained community health workers implemented RCCE efforts as part of IOM programming. IOM supported over 1,000 points of entry to undertake COVID-19 preparedness and response measures, including capacity building activities. IOM continued to support the resettlement of refugees through testing and treatment for both communicable and non-communicable diseases, vaccinations, and facilitation of travel in COVID-19 context, assisting close to 50,000 refugees. The IOM first line of defense was implemented in 18 countries and assisted over 7,000 eligible UN personnel and their dependents with COVID-19 testing, telehealth, medical movement support, and other services to stay and deliver. On COVID-19 vaccines, in line with UHC principles, we must ensure that all migrants, no matter their legal status, have equitable access. Significant barriers faced by migrants in accessing COVID-19 vaccinations remain, such as the need for specific ID, absence of firewalls between health and immigration authorities, linguistic and cultural barriers, to name a few. Noting the report of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, I am including as a coordinator for the UN Network on Migration, will continue advocating for and supporting member states on the inclusion of migrants in national COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness plans, as well as essential health services. The UN system through the network stands ready to support governments in addressing and reducing vulnerabilities faced by migrants. Thank you. Thank you to IOM. I would like to remind our non-state actors that their interventions will be taken under grouping 17.3. Madam Chair, there are no further requests for the floor for grouping 17.1. I now give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. I'll now give the floor to Dr. Michael Ryan. Dr. Michael Ryan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I will, again, try to keep my commentaries brief so as to facilitate the, the Chair's challenging uh, job. Uh, I would say, actually, very deeply and sincerely on behalf of all of the staff of WHO at all levels um, and all of our partners, uh, say thank you to the Member States for the way in which each and every one of you have recognised the huge efforts by our staff, their outstanding commitment to their jobs uh, going above and beyond the call of duty, delivering more than I or the 
Director General or the DDG could ever have imagined could be delivered by such a, a small group of people. But it is amazing what a small group of dedicated people can do when they're stimulated by the desire to save lives uh, and to support you, uh, our member states, and the communities that you support. So I'm sure every staff member around the House is very proud today and very proud to be WHO in your service and in the service of communities all over the world. Um, a number of issues uh, were, were raised, and I, m I must say very consistently between the, the last session as well. So I'm not going to re uh, relitigate all of them, but certainly a huge focus on improving global surveillance and pathogen surveillance, a focus on understanding variants more and uh, expanding sequencing. And uh, we've taken all that on board. And Obviously, we will continue to work on that. We will work with the G7 and Pathogen Surveillance Initiative. We will continue to work to implement the WHO Hub in Berlin. We will extend all of our partnerships and the epidemic intelligence from open sources uh, and other initiatives to create a, a truly um, consultative process for developing a, a, a new framework for global surveillance, but with a strong focus on local surveillance uh, as the, the, the major objective. Global surveillance does not work. Um, I've said it many times. Global weather forecasting does not work. The supercomputers do not work unless people walk out onto mountaintops every day and measure the wind speed. Uh, that is done by ordinary people everywhere in the system every day, feeding information into a global system. Um, if we put rubbish into the global system, we will get rubbish out. So we need to focus on the local capacities to measure health, local capacities to detect unusual events, but be able to bring that data centrally very quickly to assess it, to assess its relevance and importance and danger for others. Many of you mentioned, again, the health workforce and our health and care workers, and again, you highlighted and celebrated the F the sacrifices uh, that they have made, and so did the Director General in his speech. But praise um, does not solve the frustration of our health workers. They have not been adequately protected. They have not been adequately trained. They have not been adequately resourced. And having been a frontline health worker in dangerous pathogens outbreak, the danger to yourself is something that is very, very unsettling. But the greatest frustration is not being able to help the people who you have in front of you because you don't have therapeutics or you don't have oxygen or you don't even have a bed. So if we're really to do justice to our health workers, we have to equip them, train them, protect them, and ensure that they can do what they do best, which is save lives. Um, and I think that was very much a central theme in the DG speech. It was a central theme in all of you, what you said. And I'm sure health workers around the world are not only beaming with pride today, but you've generated huge expectations in them for what we will do next uh, as a collective. Um, a, a lot of focus again in your presentations on One Health and taking a, a multi-sectoral approach, uh, and clearly that's a major theme, um, on focusing in on vulnerable populations and ensuring no one is left behind, migrants, refugees, uh, people who live outside the system. Uh, if we leave anyone behind, we are all at risk. Many, many of you spoke to the issues of mental health, um, and I think this has been a hugely under-recognized and under-responded to element of this epidemic as it is in all emergencies. Uh, my colleague Deborah Castell is here from the Mental Health Department, and I know it comes up next, uh, but it's something very close to all our hearts. We've seen the terrible toll taken on communities, on health workers and others. Um, our mental health, uh, our psychological well-being is, is hugely important to us all. So, Many thanks for raising those issues. Again, you, rose the issue, you raised the issues and the challenges of dealing with misinformation, disinformation, risk communication, the science of trust, and dealing with infodemics. And I think WHO has uh, really taken major steps forward in this space uh, over the last number of years, particularly with its EpiWin and infodemics initiatives, and we continue and will are determined to continue doing so. Overall, your focus on community-centered approaches has been extremely welcome. Um, there are some specific issues that were raised regarding the universal um, UHPR, the universal peer review of uh, health and, and, and uh, systems and health and health security systems. We very much thank the member states, 11 member states, I believe, Stella, who have agreed to participate as 
pilot projects or guinea pigs, whichever way you wish to look at it. Uh, but we very much appreciate those member states' transparency and determination to show the way. Uh, Cameroon, I think, were the country that raised that and are one of the, the volunteers. Again, other countries, we've done 32 of you have done major exercises in the middle of this pandemic in order to look at your readiness. Um, and there have been 61 intra-action reviews. And again, our team here and our team at the regions have adapted our after-action review methodology so countries could carry out intra-action reviews to look at their responses and adapt their responses. And again, we thank you for that innovation and for that flex flexibility. Um, we also uh, thank member states who both are hosting and contributing to uh, the biohub concept of bringing together pathogen specimens and uh, allowing WHO to add another, we hope, flexible and successful mechanism uh, to the world's need to move specimens uh, around as quickly as possible during a crisis. Uh, second, lastly, uh, I would just, uh, or la a second, yeah, second, lastly, on origins. Um, I think there was a lot of questions from member states on the origins, and I just want to reassure everyone that, and well, first of all, to thank the team that did go to the field. There was a tremendous, tremendous amount of work done before, during, and after that mission, and we thank our, our, our Chinese colleagues for their collaboration and the, the international members who came from abroad. Uh, many of you said that this was a major first step, this was groundbreaking, this produced a tremendous amount of very useful information, but it was a step. It was not the final step, it was the first step. We continue uh, to work with many of you. We've had uh, consultations informally with many member states to look at what happens in the next phase, and we will continue to have those discussions in the coming weeks. We clearly have laid out, or the team had laid out in its uh, report, a series of further studies that need to be carried out. We've received inputs from many of you. We continue to and are very much welcoming of your suggestions around those inputs for the next phase uh, and around the need for further experts uh, to be able to carry out uh, different studies or support the implementation of, of different studies as needed. And the Director General will consider all of that in the coming weeks and we will then be able to communicate with you what we believe is the best next step in this journey. Finally, um, it will be uh, important to speak on the, many of you mentioned the, the issues of research. And this has been research and innovation, research and development have been a huge part of this response. We would like to give a shout out to uh, the thousands of researchers, the over 3,000 researchers in 134 countries, 40% of whom are in LMICs who are part of WHO's R&D Blueprint for Epidemics, and specifically the Research and Innovation Collaboration Platform for COVID-19. 5.7, in excess of $5.7 billion has been invested in the research alone around this pandemic. It's an incredible explosion of research funding. Uh, we have uh, uh, aligned priorities and aligned funding in diagnostics and vaccination and ethics and PPE and clinical IPC, animal, human and, and epidemiologic investigations in eight areas with 15 working groups. This work is not done by one person, by one team, by one program or by one organization. This is a trans-organizational effort called the R&D Blueprint for Epidemics. It represents the core of the transformational agenda that the DG has pursued and, and uh, Bruce pushes us along the road. Uh, the, the, uh, the key to this is this involves many, many programs in WHO. But uh, in particular, my colleague and partner uh, in this is um, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. This is very much a collaboration of the emergencies program with the science division. And, and Sumia may wish to take the floor if she would, because there's a lot happening in this space, and in particular around the solidarity trials, which many of the member states raised. So Sumia, please, and then back to you, Chair, after Sumia speaks. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan, for your words. I will give uh, the floor to, to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I would like to <clears throat> thank again all the member states for um, their um, remarks and uh, the positive remarks that have been made about the collaborations that we have seen over the last uh, year and a half around science and research. 
as Dr. Ryan just said, I think we've had a ex very good uh, experience on the science side by bringing together researchers, academics, scientists from all countries around the world with the first Global Research and Innovation Forum in February of 2020, following which multiple expert groups and advisory groups and networks of people were set up and have continued to work and collaborate with the spirit of open sharing uh, of research, of data, uh, advancing the science as quickly as possible. In fact, even today there is a meeting going on, a webinar on defining the correlates of protection, which as you all know is, is very, very important to advance vaccine trials and to understand protective immunity. And uh, when I uh, last left that meeting, there were over 1,500 individuals participating in that, in that webinar. So a lot has been uh, achieved, and it's thanks to the efforts of uh, people around the world. Many of you mentioned the Solidarity Trial for Therapeutics. This was a very successful trial that was launched again April of 2020 that involved over 500 institutions and hospitals with hundreds of principal investigators across 30 countries. The first phase studied four repurposed drugs, and the next phase, which is due to begin very soon, will be testing um, a, a few more immunomodulatory drugs, which uh, we hope will have some impact uh, in moderately severe and critical illness. We uh, are also planning the Solidarity Vaccine Trial Platform, which will help us to advance vaccines that uh, are coming up from the smaller companies from the biotechs, the second generation vaccines that still need to take go through clinical trials and we look forward again to collaborating with all of you uh, to make this a success. The science division has worked with the uh, emergencies program but also with the technical programs across WHO and across the three levels of the organization with our regional offices and our country offices to try to bring the high, highest quality evidence into the guidance that's been produced by WHO uh, which has been challenging at times because the science has been changing and advancing on a daily basis. And that's why we've now moved to what we call the living guidelines, the guidelines that get updated as soon as new uh, evidence is available so that we present the latest to uh, you, uh, uh, member states, to adopt into your uh, national guidelines. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. I understand that there are some member states willing to speak, so I would like to give the floor to the moderator to manage those member states, and then we carry on with the agenda. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I understand that there are member states who had raised their hands this morning who are now available to provide their interventions on item 17.1. Norway, you have the floor to be followed by Sri Lanka. Thank you, Chair. The daily global COVID-19 case count has never been higher at any other point so, so far in the pandemic than in the days and weeks leading up to this year's Health Assembly. Our work to limit the impact is far from over. First, we must increase our efforts to minimize the devastating effects of COVID-19 on individuals, on societies, and on the global community. This means continuing to implement public health and societal interventions based on best available evidence and ramping up efforts to ensure global access to tests, treatments and vaccines that are safe, efficacious and of adequate quality. It is essential that we continue increasing manufacturing capacity to increase global access to vaccines. We need full financing of the ACT Accelerator. And we must all, governments, multilateral organizations, and pharma industry included, increase our efforts to enable redistribution of vaccine doses for bilateral agreements. We need to manufacture as many doses as possible, and we need to ensure that all vaccines that can be used are put to good use. Norway has recently announced that we will share 5 million vaccine doses as part of Team Europe 
with COVAX as our preferred mechanism for dose sharing. Furthermore, we must act now to take action on the lessons learned from this pandemic. The reports and recommendations from the Independent Panel of Pandemic Preparedness and Response, from the IHR Review Committee, from the Independent Oversight and Advisory Committee, and from the Global Preparedness and Monitoring Board, provide us with the guidance we need to be better prepared for future crises. Our job is to find the best path forward to implement their recommendations. We have a responsibility to make this the main outcome of this health assembly. Norway commends the work WHO has done and continues to do so in response to the ongoing crisis. The pandemic demonstrates the pivotal role of WHO for all member states. We as member states have the responsibility to ensure that WHO has the resources and the independence necessary for the organization to be able to deliver on its mandate. Norway underlines the need to invest in long-term systems and infrastructure for pandemic, pre pandemic prevention. This is best done through strengthening health systems, investing in universal health coverage, preparedness and control through binding international collaboration. IHR is a solid legal framework, but we agree with the need to strengthen implementation and capacity building in line with IHR requirements. The crisis also demonstrates the need for a more solid scientific foundation for understanding of epidemics and their spread. We need to evaluate the effects of measures, both pharmaceutical interventions and public health and societal interventions to stop the spread and to minimize negative implications of this and future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Norway. I now give the floor to Sri Lanka to be followed by Burkina Faso. This will complete all member states who had raised their hands for 17.1 this morning. Sri Lanka, you now have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, this is related to uh, the item eight, number 18. Uh, Sri Lanka hereby... Sri Lanka, would you like to yeah. provide an intervention on 17.1? No, this is uh, this is regarding eighteen. We will come to that in our next grouping. Okay. Thank you so much, Sri Lanka. Burkina Faso, would you like to provide your intervention on seventeen point one? Okay. At this point, we have concluded all requests for a member states for the floor. I return. To Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Dr. Bruce Erwer. Dr. Erwer, you have the floor. Madam uh, Chair, <coughs> Excellencies, Delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the World Health Organization and the Implementing partners of the ACT Accelerator, which includes all of our international organizations, our industry partners, civil society partners, and of course you are our member states. I'd like to express our appreciation for the recognition of the work of the ACT Accelerator and COVAX, as well as the uh, statements of support as we move forward. Indeed, as one delegate put it, uh, we here at WHO see the success of the ACT Accelerator and COVAX as the exit strategy from the pandemic going forward. And WHO's role, of course, as many of you highlighted, central to that across so many of the elements that were discussed. I'd like to speak to five points very briefly. Um, first, the, we appreciate the emphasis on the full package of interventions. We heard the message loud and clear about the support on oxygen, which of course is a priority. Also on diagnostics, not just to manage the response, but also to open economies, open societies as we move forward. I'd like to reassure those delegates who asked that the research agenda on therapeutics, as Mike alluded to, and our chief scientist, Dr. Swaminathan, that research agenda is very much alive within the ACT Accelerator and beyond to try and ensure we do have uh, therapeutics that can help both to save lives and prevent uh, the progression of infection or even infection itself moving forward. 
On the second issue, uh, just to speak to briefly on vaccine rollout, um, we appreciate very much the statements and commitments to share doses, especially those to share doses through COVAX and to advance the sharing of doses to the uh, later this month in June, July, because this is the crucial period in which we are working to catch up to the Director General's challenge of vaccinating 10 pers- at least 10 percent coverage in all countries by the end of September en route to over 30 percent of the population in every country by the end of this year. We appreciate in that regard, of course, the support for the export of vaccines and the raw materials necessary to make them, and of course, the prioritization of health care workers and elderly populations or older populations as we move forward. On the third point, with respect to addressing the uh, egregious uh, coverage and availability of vaccines in uh, low-income, low-middle-income countries, which currently stands in many areas at less than 1%, We are, as you heard from the representative of Gavi and the COVAX facility, working across multiple dimensions to improve supply through COVAX in the near term. Most importantly, we are looking to uh, bring forward as many of our supplies as possible. We are working to diversify the portfolio, as was requested by a number of member states. We are also looking to accelerate not just the scale of donations, but also the timing of dose sharing so that, again, we can catch up as rapidly as possible. There are a number of comments about the importance of local production, and I would like to ensure you that also is a priority of both the World Health Organization, its COVAX partners, and beyond. We have established a task force within COVAX for the uh, expanded production of vaccines that looks across the spectrum of uh, increasing the supply of raw materials, increasing fill and finish, and even establishing, of course, new production facilities, particularly in poorly served or or, uh, underserved areas. That, of course, is led by our chief scientist from the WHO side, Dr. Swaminathan. There was a specific question with respect to the expression of interest for uh, the establishment of MRI RNA vaccine transfer or technology transfer hub. And uh, I just would remind uh, member states that the call for expression of interest was issued on the 16th of April. It will close in early June. At this point, we have received 18 offers of, uh, from countries in uh, 12 countries in five WHO regions to either provide tech uh, uh, mRNA technology or to host a tech hub or both. And we have also had, in addition, 21 expressions uh, from five regions of interest to receive that technology, again, all under the leadership of our uh, chief scientist, Dr. Swaminathan. In addition, of course, we are working hard to accelerate the emergency use listing of additional products to help diversify the portfolio of EU weld products, work that is led, of course, by Dr. Mariangela Samao, our Assistant Director General for Medicines, and her team. There are other challenges we heard facing middle-income countries in particular with respect to INL, no-fault compensation. We've heard that loud and clear, and we'll work with you on that moving forward. The fourth issue we heard, and the emphasis just recently from Norway, on the need to ensure all doses are put to good use. And indeed, we're already seeing challenges with uptake as we move into adult populations with a complex vaccines in some cases. And we are working with countries to try and help solve the problems around in-country financing, workforce expansion, pharmacovigilance, and vaccine confidence and hesitancy, most importantly, as we heard a number of times from you, uh, our member states. Um, the last issue I'd just like to speak to briefly is, um, is that challenge as we move forward. We really very much appreciated the comments that the challenges in front of us um, to see the ultimate success of the ACT Accelerator and COVAX are really financial and political support challenges, as the Director General spoke to and you, a number of our member states, highlighted. 
In this regard, I'd just like to take a moment to express our appreciation on behalf of the Director General and the entire ACT Accelerator Consortium to uh, His Excellency President Ramaphosa of South Africa and Her Excellency Prime Minister Solberg of Norway, who serve as the co-chairs of our Facilitation Council that works to grapple with those financial and, uh, and other challenges which hold back the full promise of the ACT Accelerator, for which we are now making progress thanks to their leadership. Finally, um, in closing, just like to uh, refer back to uh, one of the comments that was made by uh, one of our delegates about the importance of ensuring we have no white map or white spots rather on our maps going forward. And indeed, that is our intent, not with just with vaccines, but indeed all tools. And we especially appreciated the comment, I believe it was from Paraguay, of the need to vaccinate on both sides of the river. And indeed, that is our commitment to you, the member states, to do everything possible to ensure you have the tools to vaccinate on both sides of every river in every country and between every country as we move forward. To do that, we need, as the Director General called for in his opening uh, remarks, the full financing of the ACT Accelerator, its $18.5 billion gap for this year, most immediately. We need the immediate sharing of doses through the COVAX facility to optimize equitable access. And we need sharing of doses to reach a quarter of a billion people over the next four months by end of September. We need the scale-up of manufacturing, of course, and we're working across uh, a, a huge number of countries um, in that regard. And finally, of course, we need the full support for WHO's SPRP, because at the heart end of the day, that is what anchors the work of the ACT Accelerator and ensure it translates from products into actual saved lives, reduction of transmission, and an exit from this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Owa, for your words. This concludes our discussion on this topic. We will now move to the third and final grouping, World Health Organization's work in health emergencies and strengthening preparedness for health emergencies and mental health preparedness for and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The relevant documents are A17-4-9, a74 slice 10 revision 1. Guldus delegates wishing to speak, please raise their hands on the Zoom platform. I would now like to give the floor to the moderator to manage the list of speakers. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now give the floor to the Bahamas to be followed by Sri Lanka. Madam Chair, the Bahamas commands the work of the Executive Board in placing a spotlight on the issue of mental health once again. The Bahamas remains committed to improving the services that are provided in the prevention and management of mental health issues at all levels. While significant work has been achieved in the strengthening of clinical resources in the training and recruitment of mental health nurses and psychiatrists, there remains a need for the design of a mental health services construct that maps out the types of services available in country, the training and skills provided in the various spaces, the gaps that remain, and the strategic plan to improve the provision of mental health services. Several initiatives have been stalled due to the need to respond to the natural disasters caused by Category 5 hurricanes, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, there remains recognition of the need to intentionally pursue a mental health strategy that straddles existing primary care and tertiary care connection so that it becomes interwoven with the package of health service delivery. Madam Chair, the Bahamas fully endorses the three recommendations in the documents as they reflect actively both the strategy moving forward and the work underway in 
strengthening our mental health capacity and services. We look forward to the information and educational materials and other media assets that will assist in increasing the awareness of the importance of seeking and preserving good mental health. Thank you. Thank you to the Bahamas. I now give the floor to Sri Lanka to be followed by the World Federation of Public Health Associations, joined by their constituency members. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Sri Lanka hereby support the zero regional and one voice proposed by Bangladesh on uh, item 18 mental health preparedness and response to COVID-19 pandemic. Having recognized the significance of psychological distress and the rights of persons and families affected by emergencies in order to improve their quality of life, Sri Lanka uh, urgently uh, and greatly committed to take concrete steps in several areas. Sri Lanka has many achievements during this pandemic to alleviate the sufferings of people due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. They are targeted towards the well-being of frontline workers, addressing psychosocial distress among general public, with special emphasis on people who are quarantined, setting up of centers for persons with mental disorders and drug dependents who are COVID positive, home delivery of medications, special clinics within isolated areas while maintaining the routine services, a guideline for primary care physicians to manage mental disorders is not worthy. Substance abuse consequent to an emergency is a notable area to which a countrywide capacity building training have been conducted. Information generation in order to take future informed decisions are being implemented. Chairperson, we would be happy to propose the assembly to develop and further strengthening of collaborative mechanism among multi-stakeholders and a sustainable monitoring mechanism for comprehensive and coordinated actions to enhance the mental well-being of people under the following three broad actions as mentioned in the UN policy brief 13 May 2020. We expect this assembly to provide technical, sub technical support for the member states to facilitate this process. Number one, a whole of the society approach to promote, protect and care for mental health. Two, ensure widespread availability of emergency mental health and psychosocial support. Number three, support recovery from COVID-19 by building mental health services for the future. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Sri Lanka. We will be mixing member state statements with NSA constituencies as per the hands raised. Several constituencies of non-state actors in official relations with WHO have requested the floor on this grouping of agenda items. According to the privileges conferred by relationship with WHO, I have the pleasure to give to the floor to the constituency of non-state actors presented by the World Federation of Public Health Associations, joined by constituency members, the International Federation on Aging, the International Hospital Federation, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, World Organization of Family Doctors, World Federation of Occupational Therapists, and International League of Dermatological Societies. The World Federation of Public Health Associations, you have the floor to be followed by Senegal. Could you unmute? Yes. Um, lady Chair um, and dear members of the Assembly, my name is Bettina Boris, CEO of the World Federation 
our constituency consisting of major international federations of global health, primary care and social work professionals supports the WHO in its call on its member states to work together on the co-design and co-production of coordinated strategies to control the pandemic. Where countries have struggled to implement effective COVID-19 control, the political leadership has often undermined the critical role of skilled frontline professionals. The greatest success has been achieved between the government, professionals, trade unions, and communities working together with a high level of mutual trust. Where this has occurred, there has been an important increased control of the virus, allowing countries to resume freedoms and functional economies. We call on WHO and its member states to take action to ensure that treatments and vaccines are available to everyone everywhere. This requires establishing multidisciplinary engagement with local up to cross borders social protection systems to reach all people. We call WHO on to transform COVAX into a COVID-19 solidarity pooling platform, enabling knowledge sharing as well as boosting production capacity under a public health driven alliance of vaccine manufacturers dedicated to research, development, manufacturing and supply of high quality, efficient, safe and sustainable vaccines and treatments. We call upon WHO to increase preparedness, including health literacy, while decreasing vulnerability to future pandemics through reducing health and social inequalities that have undermined the current interventions in controlling this pandemic. And lastly, we call to establish a clear partnership between the politicians and the health, social and trade unions professionals to build public trust and engagement. The coalition stands ready and committed to fully utilize the skills, networks and competencies in supporting WHO and its member states to advance these solutions. We call on member states to build their strategies on the human rights-based approach to guarantee equal access to the highest attainable standards Thank you of health to the to World Federation healthy. of Public Health Associations. Your time has now elapsed. As requested, we will continue mixing the member state statements with the NSA constituencies. I now give the floor to Senegal to be followed by Cambodia. Senegal, you have the floor. I now give the floor to Cambodia to be followed by... Oh, thank you, Senegal. I see you on the screen. Please come in. Senegal, can you hear us? It appears we are experiencing technical difficulties. Senegal, we will come back to you. I now give the floor to Cambodia to be followed by the Republic of Korea. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Excellency Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Cambodia is committed to integrate mental health services into the different levels of care across the health systems. We focus on strengthening the primary health care, such as the role of the health centers, in line with the WHO recommendations and mental health global action plan. We are in the process of developing a five-year strategic action plan for mental health and substance abuse for 2022 
to 2026 with WHO technical support. We aim to ensure it effective implementations and make mental health services more available to Cambodian people, especially in the context of COVID-19 pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacts on essential health services in Cambodia, including mental health and psychosocial support. In response to the health and social economy challenges, the Ministry of Health, in collaboration with the UN agencies, including WHO, IOMs, UNICEF, and GNIPAs, has adopted a whole system approach covering communities, relief health support groups, health centers, and rural hospitals, as well as real business facility staff, to enhance the quality of health services delivery on mental health and psychosocial supports. As a result, a range of key stakeholders across the country has gained knowledge and skill on mental health and psychosocial support in response to COVID-19. This includes more than 2,000 health staff from health centers and district peripheral hospitals, and more than 600 frontline COVID health staff and health officials of the MU, Ministries of Health, Ministries of Defense, medical volunteers. The Ministry of Health is making effort to integrate mental health and psychosocial support into the existing hotline of 115 at the quarantine centers. At the community level, the awareness raising sections on mental health and psychosocial support were conducted for villages and village health support groups and awareness raising materials on COVID-19 related anxiety and depression management suicide prevention and basic social, psycho social support and relaxation were produced and distributed among the populations. Additionally, virtual training on mental health and psychosocial support were conducted for Cambodian Red Cross staff. And the op operational guide on, on psychos logical first aid in school were developed and endorsed by the Ministry of Education sport for implementation at school. The COVID-19 pandemic response provides an opportunity for strengthening health system for the future. The Ministry of Health is making an effort to transform mental health service delivery within the overall process of the health system transformation in Cambodia. I thank Madam Chair. Thank you, Cambodia. I now give the floor to the Republic of Korea to be followed by the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam Moderator. The Republic of Korea would like to reiterate the importance of WHO in emergency response and would like to thank the WHO for its efforts. And in this regard, Korea stands firmly with the MICTA statement on COVID-19. On this occasion, Korea would like to elaborate on the issue of mental health. Prolonged social distancing measures have led many people to suffer from stress and depression. Aimed to address this COVID-19 blues, the Korean government established the national five-year mental health plan this January to, enhan to enhance mental health of all Koreans. This plan expands non-face-to-face -face psychological support services via mobile apps and social networking sites and strengthens outreach health services like the Mental Health Ambulance Program. The Republic of Korea remains vigilant against the exacerbation of ex existing mental health conditions and is striving to make mental health services universal. Also, in line with the recommendation given by the updated Mental Health Action Plan for 2013 to 2030, the Korean government mapped out the budget plans for our national plan for the next five years in order to ensure that it is concrete and realizable. Considering that demand for mental health services will remain high after the pandemic, a total of approximately $1.8 billion will be invested in post-COVID-19 mental health measures, which will be used to expand community-based mental health services and strengthen early intervention and treatment to prevent serious mental illnesses. In addition, 
The Republic of Korea will expand research and development to enable systematic research on COVID-19's impact on mental health. We are planning a six-year panel study to assess COVID-19's impact on mental health and will identify factors affecting individual, social, and collective mental health while developing psychological support and early intervention technologies. As mentioned at the previous executive board, it is necessary to share each country's face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face mental health policies, as well as socio-psychological policies for the general public and people with mental illnesses. We hope that such form of discussion could be convened by the WHO. On that note, the Republic of Korea endorses the update, updated and comprehensive mental health action plan that takes COVID-19 responses and recovery processes into consideration. We sincerely hope that people all over the world could remain physically and mentally healthy as we combat COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you to the Republic of Korea. I now give the floor to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to be followed by Fiji. Thank you for the papers and presentations. The UK has been a strong advocate for the World Health Emergencies Programme since its very inception in 2016. The programme has achieved a huge amount in its first five years, saving countless lives and stopping dozens of health emergencies in their tracks. COVID-19 has demonstrated, however, that we must go further and faster in strengthening global preparedness for health emergencies. Indeed, to prevent the next pandemic, the UK believes that we need a paradigm shift with a strengthened WHO, new legally binding obligations for member states with the means to ensure compliance, including for the IHR, an adequate, sustainable financing for pandemic prevention and preparedness. That's why the UK strongly supports the resolutions being adopted by this Assembly today. The WHO strengthening resolution contains no fewer than 65 operative paragraphs, laying the foundations for immediate reform in all the most important areas, from One Health to the Emergency Committee and from alert systems to peer reviews. It rightly calls upon Member States as well as the WHO to strengthen preparedness, we commend the European Union for its stewardship of this enormous piece of work and we look forward to getting started together on implementation in the working group established by the resolution as soon as this assembly concludes. The UK believes that in the longer term we must go even further to deliver this paradigm shift that we need. That's why we have worked so closely with Chile, European Union and many other partners to bring to this Assembly a decision relating to a new pandemic treaty or convention. We'd like to thank delegates for their constructive and committed approach to the discussions in this area, which have enabled us to agree to hold a special session of this Assembly in November focused specifically on this issue. We align with the joint statement on this decision by our South African colleagues. We also welcome the resolution on mental health preparedness and commend Thailand for its leadership on this important issue. On the Health Emergencies Programme, at previous governing bodies, we have flagged the need to strengthen functional capacities, including HR, deployment processes, administrative and reporting capabilities, and increased capacity in priority countries facing emergencies. The ongoing Commission examining sexual exploitation and abuse in the DRC highlights the increased risk of such issues in the context of emergencies and conflict. The WHO systems in emergencies and in all its work must be fully equipped to prevent and respond to these abuses. As we've heard from the reviews, the requirements on the emergencies programme have grown exponentially, while its budget has grown only incrementally. That is unsustainable. The programme must be sufficiently funded if we expect it to protect us all from health threats. That's one reason for the UK's significant and fully flexible core contribution, and we encourage others to continue to invest in this vital collective endeavour. Thank you very much. Thank you to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I now give the floor to Fiji to be followed by 
Angola. I see that Fiji has now removed their hand and would like to take up this intervention at a later point. I give the floor to Angola to be followed by the world. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Angola welcomes the initiative of the Executive Board of Strengthening and Improving the International Health Regulation 2005. We consider that COVID-19 pandemic was the most important test for the application of the International Health Regulation. The implementation of the recommended action was a great challenge due to the speed of disease spread, insufficient coordination, and the initial guidelines. More gradually, the national notification of the cases, the capacity for laboratory confirmation, the application of measures at the level of entry point and general response activities gradually improved. My apologies. With the COVID-19 vaccine already on the market and My the other in process of approval, we hope that we are having technical will be issues taken with the sound. Could you kindly come closer to the microphone for the ease of interpretation? Thank you so much. Okay. The unfair and the equitable access to the vaccine will continue to undermine the effort of states to control the spread of this pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the daily feedback policy has been regularly disseminated throughout the network of our national health system. Surveillance for other diseases of international concern, such as yellow fever, is being carried out on a routine basis. Dear Angola delegation agrees. of Angola, my sincere apologies, but there are sound issues. Could you try coming closer to the microphone or removing your mask if you are socially distant? So that we can ensure that the interpreters are able to pick up the sound. Can you kindly begin your intervention from the beginning to ensure that we can capture it in its entirety? Angola, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Angola welcomes the initiative of the Executive Board of Strengthening and Improving the International Health Regulation 2005. We consider that COVID-19 pandemic was the most important test for the application of international health regulation. The implementation of the recommended action was a great challenge due to the speed of the disease spread. The, the insufficient coordination scale initially guidelines. Sincere apologies on behalf of the interpreters. The sound quality uh, is unfeasible. Capacity for the laboratory confirmation, the application of measures at the level of, of entry points, and the general response activities gradually improved. With COVID 19 vaccines already in the market and the others in the process of approval, we hope the concrete actions will be taken to make them effectively available at the all countries. Indeed, we firmly believe that without a strong commitment in this sense, the unfair and the unequitable access to the vaccine will, be, will continue to undermine the efforts of the state to control the spread of the pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the daily feedback bulletin has been regularly disseminated throughout the network of our national health system. Surveillance for the other diseases of international concern, such as yellow fever, is being carried out on routine basis. 
basis. Angola agrees and supports the proposal mentioned in the document. Thank you very much, moderator. Many thanks, Angola. We will be mixing the member state statements with the non-state actor constituencies, as previously mentioned. The World Dental Federation will now take the floor, joined by the constituency members, the International Pharmaceutical Federation, and the World Medical Association, to be followed by Uruguay. Distinguished delegates, I speak on behalf of FDI World Dental Federation, International Pharmaceutical Federation, and World Medical Association. We are part of a broader coalition of health professionals that represents over 41 million nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists, dentists, and physicians. Having a strong health workforce is key to supporting the world through any health emergency. We urge member states to heed the independence panel's urgent call to take immediate action to stop the pandemic and to follow recommendations to ensure that any future infectious disease outbreak does not become another catastrophic pandemic. In particular, countries must invest in preparedness now and support their health professionals accordingly. On the COVID-19 response, we ask member states to, one, provide channels for health professionals to have timely access to the latest accurate and comprehensive information and guidance on COVID-19, including PPE considerations and on best practices through the pandemic across countries, free from political interference and manipulation. Two, guarantee continuity of essential health services and avoid diagnosis and treatment backlogs. Three, further invest in infrastructure and update regulations for immunization to ensure health systems have the capacity for population-wide COVID-19 immunization and that all priority groups, including health professionals, are given precedence in the vaccination rollout in all countries. Four, acknowledge there is a need to separate science and politics and actively involve health professionals in decision-making. On emergency preparedness, we ask member states to one, support the call for expeditiously negotiating an international legal instrument to address future pandemics. Two, set up a funding mechanism to support developing countries in strengthening their health and education systems for future health emergencies, avoiding disruption of essential health services and supplies. Three, ensure that health facilities provide positive practice environments through the sufficient qualified um, staffing and decent working conditions including occupational safety, manageable workloads, stress reduction measures, adequate remuneration uh, and protection from violence, abuse and discrimination, and provision of psychosocial support and counseling. Four, include emergency preparedness and response, including guidance on PPUs in all health professional education curricula and ensure continuing professional development. Five, work with health professionals to foster collaboration between professions to strengthen current care delivery and resilience for the future. In addition, we urge member states to prioritize the promotion of mental health and psychosocial well-being in COVID-19 recovery plans and to place a strong focus on those most vulnerable, including health professionals. Thank you. Thank you to the FDI World Dental Federation and constituency members. I now give the floor to Uruguay to be followed by Brazil. Uruguay, you have the floor. I understand that we may be experiencing technical issues. We will come back to Uruguay. We will continue with Brazil, followed by Paraguay. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I hope you can hear me. This is Brazil. Um, we hear you well. Thank you. We thank the Secretariat for facilitating a forward-looking discussion about the opportunities for making progress on strengthening the WHO 
in order to allow the organization to fulfill its respective mandate and roles in preventing, detecting, and responding to health emergencies. In this regard, we would like to stress the need to intensify cooperation and collaboration at all levels in order to contain and control the COVID-19 pandemic and mitigate its impact. It's imperative to provide the WHO with the tools and resources it needs to better prepare to protect humanity against public health emergencies through an effective, coordinated, multi-sectoral and evidence-based public health response. If, on the one hand, we need to make WHO's decision-making process more efficient and to enhance institutional capacity, on the other hand, such processes must be transparent, inclusive, and contextualized to different needs across regions and countries. Regarding, regarding item 18, Brazil reiterates its support to the Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan 2013-2030 and co-sponsors the relevant decision. Mental health conditions affect all areas of life, especially during a pandemic that has demanded, demanded relevant individual and social sacrifices from us all. Guaranteeing universal access to mental health services is thus fundamental to mitigate important consequences of COVID-19. There is an ever-growing need to invest in and develop strategies and actions to treat mental health problems, including establishing online services, such as remote medical attention for safe diagnosis and offering full treatment co coverage for health workers and other frontline professionals. According to recent data collected by the Brazilian Ministry of Health, there is a drastic increase of mental health conditions among the Brazilian population due to COVID-19, such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress. To cope with this new reality, Brazil has increased the funding of its psychosocial care network, a specialized service that offers free of charge medical attention for mental health patients through the public health care system. Frontline health workers facing COVID-19 in particular are offered special mental health services through the so-called Tele-PSI project, which provides psychological and psychiatric online support to help them manage stress, anxiety, depression, and irritability. Brazil takes mental health care seriously because the consequences of COVID-19 are not only physical, but also psychological and psychosocial. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Brazil. I now give the floor to Paraguay to be followed by the World Heart Federation and its constituency members. Paraguay, you have the floor. Si. Yes. Good day to all. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Uh... Madam President, the proposal covers the most important uh, aspects related to recovery of member states from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it focuses uh, on capacity building uh, when it comes to being able to respond to the challenges that we face with this pandemic and to promote uh, the well-being and mental health. Uh, Paraguay supports the proposal. It's a timely proposal and it will allow us to promote a better response at member state level when it comes to mental health. An essential pillar here needs to be supporting mechanisms that allow for a regulatory framework for mental health services. That way we'll be able to help people to get better care and better treatment in accordance with their needs. Also looking at care at community level and uh, do this in a very inclusive way. We need laws, policies, and national mental health plans that facilitate implementation of measures and the management of funds dedicated to mental health. Uh, this document is extremely relevant uh, since uh, our country is implementing a reform of its mental health system within the special initiative regarding mental health of WHO. We will continue in the implementation of this initiative uh, 
and will also continue implementing our national plan in response to COVID-19. Omni will strengthen proper coverage throughout the country with community-based responses. Thank you. Thank you, Paraguay. As previously mentioned, we will be mixing in non-state actor constituencies with the member state interventions. I now give the floor to the World Heart Federation, joined by the constituency members, the Framework Convention Alliance on Tobacco Control, the International Alliance of Patients Organizations, the International Diabetes Federation, the International Society of Nephrology, the World Hypertension League, and the World Stroke Organization. The World Heart Federation, you have the floor to be followed by Uruguay. Honorable Chair, distinguished delegates, we, the members of the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health and supported by the NCD Alliance, thank you for this opportunity to jointly address the World Health Assembly on one of the most critical subjects of our time. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken an incalculable toll on the mental, fiscal, and of course, physical health of our societies. This past year has united us in facing a truly global challenge, but it has also exposed deep, enduring fault lines and inequalities, inequities, in the population health and health systems of nearly every country represented here today. The WHO's pulse surveys have demonstrated that essential services for NCDs and mental health have been heavily disrupted in almost every member state, but only 18 of these have reported that NCDs are included in national preparedness and response plans. As the chief representatives of the global circulatory health community and patients, we have a unique responsibility to draw your attention to the tsunami of post-pandemic consequences lying in wait. The combined impacts of cardiac complications due to COVID-19 and interruptions to crucial medical interventions and ongoing care for people living with hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, stroke, and other circulatory conditions, those most at risk of poor outcomes from COVID-19, will almost certainly exacerbate the already huge burden borne by stressed health systems worldwide. We therefore implore you, our members and our partners in health, to urgently address the key risk factors and preventative measures that can help fight the hidden syndemic of non-communicable and especially circulatory diseases and COVID-19. We call on member states to prioritize ongoing prevention, screening, and treatment for circulatory conditions in national COVID-19 response and recovery plans through concerted patient co-creation and collaboration. Increase domestic allocation of resources and develop targeted policies to tackle CVD and NCD risk factors, including the commercial determinants of health, through funding mechanisms such as taxation of unhealthy commodities. Integrate monitoring and data collection on NCD prevalence, comorbidities, and risk factors into measures of pandemic readiness, resilience, and response, and strengthen primary health care to ensure equitable access to essential health services, particularly for people living with NCDs and in low resource settings. We thank you for your attention and remain dedicated to supporting you in these vital endeavors so that together we may prepare for and with perseverance prevent the next global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you to the World Heart Federation. I now give the floor to Uruguay to be followed by Kenya. Uruguay, you have the floor. It appears we are still experiencing technical difficulties. We will move forward with the giving the floor to Kenya, followed by the Global Health Council and its constituency members, and then we'll return to Uruguay. Thank you, Chair. Kenya aligns this statement with that which Zambia will present on behalf of the African member states. Kenya is a state party of the IHR and has progressively instituted legislative, regulatory, and policy mechanisms 
to incorporate the provisions of the IHR. The government priority development agenda on universal health coverage is a critical prerequisite in building the necessary resilience in the health systems and core national capacities to prevent, detect, and respond to public health events. To guide national health emergency policy and investment, the government in 2017 undertook an IHR joint external evaluation which revealed that Kenya had achieved developed capacity for most of IHR core capacity areas. However, it, has, it also revealed that additional effort was needed to move to demonstrated and sustainable IHR capacities. As a result, the government conducted extensive and multi-sector consultations with the main stakeholders involved in IHR implementation and subsequently launched the National Action Plan for Health Security, NAFS, in 2019. The challenge that now remains in funding for action plan, which is largely supported by domestic resources and some uh, development partners. Uh, regarding the uh, agenda on mental health, the mental duress and anguish caused by the pandemic has severely affected lives and livelihoods and has had a catastrophic impact on our citizens. Kenya therefore adopted a whole society approach to promote, protect and care for mental health as an essential component of the national COVID-19 response through various mental health and psychosocial support activities. Under this initiative, social welfare assessments and reintegration of people in quarantine and isolation uh, back to their communities was also supported. Kenya also developed mental health and psychosocial support guidelines for public uh, emergencies and prioritized psychological first aid training for COVID-19 response teams. Frontline workers as well as community health volunteers to strengthen MHS PSS response at all healthcare levels, including the, co the communities. Kenya commits to progressively increase access to quality, affordable care for mental health conditions within health and social services as envisioned under the government universal health coverage agenda and support WHO's commitment to progressively cover 1 billion additional people living with non-communicable diseases and mental health conditions by 2023 with essential health services and medicines. We urge member states to increase investment into management of mental health and request the Director General to ensure that mental health departments, human and financial resources needs are adequately catered for. I thank you. Thank you, Kenya. I now give the floor to the Global Health Council, joined by the constituency members, the International Women's Health Coalition, Save the Children Fund, the Task Force for Global Health, United Nations Foundation, Women Deliver, World Vision International, Intra Health International, and PATH. The Global Health Council, you have the floor to be followed by Uruguay. Thank you, moderator. More than a year into this COVID-19 pandemic, over 1 billion vaccine doses have been delivered globally. Yet, access to vaccines and other life-saving tools has not been equitable. The pandemic has spotlighted health inequities, which allowed the virus to continue to spread, mutate, and overwhelm health systems, leaving marginalized populations further behind. These inequities were not born of COVID-19, and inadequate investment and policy responses risk further widening the gap. 
We applaud WHO efforts to address inequities through strengthened international cooperation, and we support negotiations to improve international pandemic preparedness. Collective action with WHO leading the charge is critical to end this pandemic, achieve equitable recovery, and create stronger, resilient systems. We urge member states to maximize dose sharing through COVAX, fully fund the ACT Accelerator, support CTAP, address barriers to expand vaccine supply, and commit political leadership to oversee response and recovery. We welcome the Director General's update on implementation of Resolution 73.1, which acknowledges COVID-19's contribution to disruptions to essential health services. And we urge member states to increase investment in health systems, including workforce, to ensure continuity and strengthening of services in pursuit of health for all. We need a holistic approach to pandemic prevention, preparedness, response, and health system strengthening. To prepare for future health emergencies, WHO and member states must urgently improve global coordination, increase sustainable financing for preparedness, including through a catalytic mechanism, and invest in better and more effective surveillance systems and field epidemiology training. National and global responses to future health emergencies must include one, investment in national leadership positions, multi-sectoral coordination, implemented action plans, and sustained funding to increase global health security to fully reach IHR compliance. Two, prioritization of regional research and manufacturing capacity. Three, strengthened medical and pharmaceutical supply chains in advance of health emergencies. Four, incorporation of pathogen spillover prevention and zoonotic risk assessment. And five, training and support for a broad range of health workforce cadres. Member states, WHO, and other stakeholders must promote an all-of-society approach to health system strengthening and pre pandemic preparedness that includes meaningful civil society engagement and ad addresses inequities at their roots. Building health system resilience requires not only recruiting Thank one... Thank you to the Global Health Council. Your time has elapsed. I now give the floor to Uruguay to be followed by China. Many thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Uruguay is grateful for the report presented by the Secretariat on uh, item 18 uh, of the agenda, preparation on mental health and COVID-19. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has shown uh, more than ever that we are all uh, vulnerable uh, to uh, mental illness. Uh, because in this context, each and every one of us uh, had to live in their own uh, flesh, uh, physical and uh, social distancing. And uh, now we understand that when we talk about mental health, we're talking about in investing in commitment, uh, in who we are, regardless of where we are. Uh, over these months of pandemic, we also understood the importance of uh, emotional approaches, which is our central part of any cure. For Uruguay, there is no comprehensive health without mental health. Uh, our country has adopted specific legislation on mental health uh, that has as its main objective to guarantee uh, the protection of mental health. Uh, for the... We hear you well. Thank you. Uruguay has adopted specific legislation on mental health that has as its major goal um, the, guaranteeing the protection of mental health for the inhabitants of our country uh, with a human rights perspective, uh, especially bearing in mind the rights of those who use mental health services. And this is covered in our uh, na national uh, um, mental health system. Our national health program adopted in 2020 wants to contribute to the mental health of individuals through uh, the implementation of the most effective strategies to promote mental health of individuals. Uh, we also want to reduce the mortality 
and uh, morbidity of, of individuals with uh, mental disorders and provide quality care based uh, on a human rights approach that has a communitary and intersectorial uh, focus. Uh, the national program involves a change in the care model. It includes the entire society, academia, social organizations, users, the users' families, uh, as well as uh, UN uh, organizations and agencies. This is uh, the way to cure mental disease. Uh, we also address things at an educational and as well as uh, in the work context. The comprehensive program of action for mental health 2013-2030 uh, will also provide psychosocial support and this is especially relevant bearing in mind the COVID-19 pandemic and is part of our broader efforts to recover essential services uh, and to maintain the milestones achieved with respect to universal health coverage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uruguay. I now give the floor to China to be followed by Japan. Thank you, Madam Chair. This delegation thanks the Director General for his report. WHO's work in the field of emergencies to mental health preparedness and response to the COVID-19 pandemic and appreciates WHO's tireless efforts in responding to multiple emergencies other than COVID-19. The World Health Organization in the field of public health emergency work fruitful. China believes that the world today still has many natural disasters and conflicts, infectious disease, are still occurring in many countries, developing countries. The, health the World Health Organization should give full play to the, its core leadership, strengthen the uh, three levels of uh, the nation, utilize the existing resources, and help the poor countries promote uh, their health emergency core capacity protect the vulnerable groups such as women and children and focus on their mental health. China would like to suggest that the DG's role in uh, pooling the funding should be strengthened. The national coordination mechanism should be improved while the specific uh, should be more detailed. Also, we suggest the developed countries to actively honor their international obligations, fulfill their uh, responsibilities, and play a more important role in protecting one house. China would like to co-sponsor the uh, resolution proposed by EU and some other member states. Thank you, Chair. I now give the floor to Japan to be followed by the IFPMA constituency. Thank you, Madam Moderator. We appreciate the Secretariat for an insightful report with data. Japan supports the resolution on strengthening the WHO and the decision for the World Health Assembly special session as a co-sponsor, it is clear <clears throat> that the WHO's coordination and the collaboration <clears throat> is uh, WHO's coordination and the collaboration with other UN agencies, governments, and the civil society is needed more than ever. In this context, we would like to make four points. First, given the importance to take part in the international rulemaking to tackle pandemics and other health emergencies. Japan would like to actively contribute to discussion on international instruments. Second, for WHO to play a more leading, convening, and coordinating role in emergency response with independent capability 
while ensuring other important functions such as providing technical advice and support. We would like to underline the importance of governance. We support a stronger executive board, which would work together with the Secretariat hand in hand, recognizing that stronger governance will ensure transparency and accountability while building a greater leadership in global health. Third, Japan would like to ask the Secretariat to share with member states their views on the future roadmap for various stakeholders to fulfill their roles in health emergencies while preventing the application of functions based on recommendations made by the independent panel, the IHL Review Committee, and the IOAC. Fourth, Japan supports the Secretariat's decision on the updated mental health action plan. We resonate with the WHO's concerns about increased anxiety, depression, and stress caused by COVID-19, in addition to exhaustion of medical personnel. For example, we are seeing an increase in the number of suicides among young people nationwide and worldwide. Therefore, Japan began to work on these mental issues. We also appreciate the Secretariat's strong emphasis on suicide prevention, mental health of vulnerable groups across the lifespan, such as children, adolescents, and pregnant mothers, and the mental health of frontline health and social care workers. We are looking forward to new data and future guidelines by WHO for groups with these particular risks. Chair, Japan has been also working on the growing problem of social anxiety, loneliness, and isolation under COVID-19 through a whole of government approach. We are eager to share our lessons and experiences collaborating with WHO to contribute to global health, in particular, mental health. Finally, Madam Chair, Japan is pleased to see this health assembly reaffirming our collective efforts to end the current pandemic and to prevent future pandemics. I thank you. Thank you, Japan. I now give the floor to the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, joined by the constituency member, Global South Care Federation, to be followed by Australia. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, GSCF and IFPMA, supported by IGBA, welcome the opportunity to make this constituency statement under Agenda Item 17. Innovative health industries continue to remain at the forefront of the global effort to develop and manufacture tests, therapeutics, preventative tools, and vaccines to contain and defeat COVID uh, and of ensuring these rich people everywhere. This massive and unprecedented effort is moving with tremendous pace. After more than 200 clinical trials and nearly 300 partnerships and collaborations among manufacturers worldwide, COVID vaccine production has increased from zero to 2.2 billion doses by the end of May, with an astounding estimate of 11 billion doses by the end of this year, enough doses to vaccinate the world's adult population. As Dr. Tedder stated, the private sector has an essential role to play in combating this public health crisis through the expertise, innovation, and resources. That said, COVID vaccines currently are not equally reaching all priority populations worldwide. Immediate action must focus on stepping up responsible dose sharing and maximizing production without compromising quality and safety. Global health challenges such as this require truly inclusive cooperation and a redoubling of efforts to ensuring health system resilience. Manufacturers, governments, and NGOs must work together to take urgent steps to further address this inequity, and the industry recently proposed five concrete steps that will deliver in the short term. Those can be found on IFPMA website. 
We urge governments in coordination with WTO to eliminate all trade and regulatory barriers to export and to facilitate and expedite the cross-border supply of key raw materials, essential manufacturing materials, medicines and vaccines, and prioritize the movement of skilled vaccine manufacturing workforce. We call on member states to ensure that they are ready and able to rapidly deploy available doses and to mitigate the risks to the production and deployment of other vaccines vital to public health worldwide. We also urge governments to guarantee immediate and unhindered access to pathogens and associated information regarding any COVID, COVID variants to support the development of new vaccines and treatments. It is important that the world uses the lessons we have learned during the COVID crisis to make sure we are all better prepared in the future. Industry is committed to delivering preparedness solutions and to contributing our expertise to relevant discussions. We look forward to being included in the design of the potential pandemic treaty or other international instrument and in playing a meaningful role in shaping the future so we are stronger together for the next health emergency. Thank you. Thank you, IFPMA and its constituency members. I now give the floor to our chair for an announcement, after which we will continue with member state interventions. Delegates. Delegates, with your permission, I would like to seek the indulgence of the interpreters to allow us to extend our meeting today by an additional 20 minutes to, to help us move forward on this agenda item. That means that we close at 1726. Are you okay with that? Thank you very much. I see we have the agreement of the interpreters and thank you very much for your amazing uh, work. So now, I return to the floor to the moderator to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now give the floor to Australia to be followed by Norway. Thank you, Chair. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to cause devastation and continuously reminds us of the importance of mobilising collective action. Australia is standing with our neighbours to prevent and respond to disease outbreaks and support the recovery from COVID-19. Australia has provided $623.2 million um, to assist countries in the Pacific and Southeast Asia to access COVID-19 vaccines through our Vaccine Access and Health Security Initiative to provide vaccines and comprehensive end-to-end -end support and the Quad Vaccine Partnership, which aims to provide over 1 billion vaccines to the Indo-Pacific by 2022. This builds on our contributions to the COVAX facilities advanced market commitment, which has distributed already over 12 million doses to Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and our commitment to share our national supply with our neighbours in the region. We now need a plan setting out priorities and clear actions to direct implementation of reforms by member states and the WHO in the immediate and longer term. We support the IHR Review Committee's recommendations focused on countries strengthening the integration of IHR core capacities within the broader health system and essential public health functions to improve emergency preparedness, surveillance and response. Australia continues to support our neighbours to strengthen our region's public health capacities, including by providing technical assistance and in-country deployments to support health emergency response coordination, laboratory strengthening and disease surveillance. A strong emergency response delivered by strong health systems is vital if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals. Recognising that monitoring and evaluation enhance implementation, we also support recommendations to strengthen country preparedness through peer review systems and transparent reporting. We would welcome a further update from the WHO on the trial of the Universal Health and Preparedness Review. 
We strongly endorse the importance of enhancing One Health approaches as recognised across all the review reports. This includes taking a global approach to reduce the risk of future zoonotic disease transmission. We must address high-risk interactions between humans and wildlife that give rise to zoonotic pandemics and also their environmental drivers, such as urban encroachment and wildlife habitat loss. Effective governance of One Health across multiple UN agencies and focus on reducing health threats to human populations will be critical. As part of our collective efforts to enhance the global pandemic preparedness, Australia is pleased to co-sponsor the resolution and the decision point on strengthening WHO preparedness and response to health emergencies to take forward the recommendations in the independent review reports and to engaging in working groups to take forward reform efforts. Finally, Australia endorses the updated Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan 2013 to 2030. This pandemic has had far-reaching consequences on mental health and we must act to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Australia. I now give the floor to Norway to be followed by Canada. Thank you, Chair. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that the world needs WHO to coordinate the global response to health emergencies. To deliver on this expectation, WHO's capacity to coordinate and respond must be strengthened. This is why Norway has supported the WHO health emergency program since its inception. We have also consistently supported the contingency fund for emergencies to enable WHO to be prepared for responding to new crises. We believe this is the most effective form of assistance. Five years ago, the Security Council adopted Resolution 2286, recognizing that attacks on healthcare was a growing challenge in conflicts. Unfortunately, the trend of destroying health systems and denying civilian access to basic life-saving services has continued. Lack of respect for and weak implementation of international humanitarian law by parties to conflict is a challenge. We must invest in better protective measures in emergency operations at all levels, including community engagement, acceptance building, and ensuring quality of healthcare. WHO has an important role to play in providing data which can be used by all relevant stakeholders to address the different facets of attacks on healthcare. Mental health is one of the most neglected areas of health, in particular during emergencies. Ensuring that mental health services are provided as part of primary healthcare is not less important during the pandemic. We need to rethink the measures needed to ensure services for some of the most vulnerable groups in this crisis. In Norway's strategy on MC, in the context of our Thank you, Norway. I now give the floor to Canada to be followed by Indonesia. Thank you, Chair. The COVID-19 pandemic has clearly demonstrated that the WHO's work in health emergency preparedness and response is critical and that we must work together to strengthen the international system so that this never happens again. This includes working together to address the secondary impacts of the pandemic, including on mental health. We must continue to prioritize those whose mental health and well-being has been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, including health and care workers, as well as all individuals on the front lines, the majority of whom are women. That is why Canada welcomes the endorsement of the updated Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan and its updated targets and recommended interventions. We would like to thank Thailand for its leadership on the decision point on promoting mental health preparedness and response for public health emergencies, which Canada was pleased to co-sponsor. We would also like to thank the WHO Secretariat and all member states for their efforts in making this action plan timely and robust. The updates to the targets and options for implementation are a significant step to accelerate good mental health for all. 
To achieve these goals, we need to commit to transparent and regular reporting on our progress. The updated action plan comes at a crucial moment as the international community begins to consider what it means to build back better in light of COVID-19. The pandemic has highlighted the need for additional global and national action on mental health, including strengthening health systems and psychosocial supports. Now is the time for member states to translate words into action and make progress on the implementation of the updated action plan and its associated targets. This will help get the world back on track to achieve, to achieve the SDGs, including, including those related to universal health coverage and as part of efforts to build resilience for future health emergencies. Finally, it is paramount that we engage communities and populations in our efforts because their insights can help us develop more responsive and innovative approaches. This global momentum on mental health is heartening. Our challenge now is how we can build on this momentum and enhance our efforts together. Canada looks forward to working with all partners and supporting progress against the action plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Canada. I now give the floor to Indonesia to be followed by Israel. Thank you, Chair. Indonesia aligned itself to the statement that will be delivered by Bangladesh on behalf of the 11 shared member states on mental health. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected the mental health and psychosocial well-being of all people. This includes health and care workers, frontline workers, and those in vulnerable situations, as well as those with the existing mental health condition. Fear, uncertainty, and anxiety over the development of the pandemic calls for strengthening mental health and resilience. This could be done through an inclusive, multi-stakeholders approach involving different professions related to mental health. It is also important to do in early detection of mental health issues in the community. In this regard, we welcome the steps taken by the WHO in mitigating various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which have spilled over into various aspects of health, including mental health. Chair, as has been highlighted many times during the assembly, COVID-19 has showed various weak links of the global health system. We need to transform the global health system to allow it to be more resilient towards the next unpredictable public health emergency. We take note of the new initiatives conducted by the WHO in the context of strengthening preparedness for health emergencies. Indonesia can support such initiatives and their implementation should respect the principle of equity, equality, and transparency. Indonesia supports exchange of experience and lesson learned to promote accountability and improve global preparedness and response system, including compliance to the International Health Regulation 2005. Therefore, Indonesia has volunteered to be involved in the Universal Health and Preparedness Review Initiative. Indonesia recognizes the need for a whole government and a whole society approach to improving global public health preparedness and that it requires the support and highest political commitment. In closing, Indonesia support the resolution on strengthening of WHO emergency and preparedness and look forward to contribute meaningful at the open-ended working group to discuss further on how we can strengthen preparedness and response. In this regard, Indonesia would like to confirm our co-sponsorship of the resolution. Ending the pandemic should be our collective objective. Thank you. Thank you, Indonesia. I now give the floor to Israel to be followed by Zambia. Many thanks.
Israel has a novel called Sorbald, which is very interesting to read. Let me read an expert for you. It's a special bird that is a guardian of all our feelings. It absorbs our fears, our hopes, all our emotions. It also tries to help to transform all of these emotions into positive actions. We try to teach our children and hope that this bird will protect their souls. This has also been our approach here at the WHO for Israel. This is why it's so important to focus on mental health for our country. We're also very much attached to universal health care, and we think mental health should be part of that. For a long time, mental health has been a sort of side issue at the WHO. We really appreciate the fact that the WHO is now coming to the forefront of our discussions. I think that we should keep this as a priority activity here at the WHO. Indeed, mental health has not been an issue even before the pandemic, but now as we are entering into the first year of this uh, terrible scourge, we see that mental health has become even more important amongst our priorities. We hope that uh, we will be able to provide the best mental health care possible. In Israel, we are trying to adopt a holistic approach to mental health. This will include work, leisure activities, and so forth. All our services have continued to work even during the lockdown to ensure mental health in our country. We want to ensure that uh, we're, we're ensuring that mental health is part of our national program. Please make sure that this uh, this uh, important issue is highlighted throughout the work uh, moving forward. Thank you, Israel. I now give the floor to Zambia to be followed by Bangladesh. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Zambia is honored to deliver this statement on behalf of the Africa region. The Africa region commends the efforts highlighted in the reports contained in the reference documents and other initiatives. We are, however, concerned with the current global response to the COVID-19 pandemic that has fallen short on aspects of global solidarity despite commendable efforts by WHO to support a coordinated global response. The accelerated R&D efforts for vaccines have not been supported with mechanisms for ensuring equitable and timely access by all countries, resulting in enormous access challenges in developing countries. While we appreciate the areas of focus of interventions by the Secretariat contained in the report, we know that some aspects of re resolution WHA 73.1 are not addressed. The report avoids any discussion on critical challenges that member states, particularly low middle income countries face, such as ensuring adequate, affordable and sustainable supplies of commodities for COVID-19. The resolution specifically requests the Director General to identify and present options, including to the use of the flexibilities in the WTO TRIPS agreement for scaling up development, manufacturing and distribution capacities needed for transparent, equitable and timely access to diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19 response. Further, it does not provide any information on the work done, if any, by WHO in this regard. 
it is critical that this aspect of the resolution is urgently and effectively addressed. We therefore request the Secretariat to report on the current status on the availability and access to vaccines for developing countries, the challenges faced by COVAX, options to overcome those challenges, including alternative options that make use of TRIPS flexibilities. Secretariat should also report on the existing regulatory approval pathways for vaccines and the support that they can provide to member states, especially developing countries. In addition, we request Secretariat to establish a time-bound expert working group to consider the existing technical and scientific evidence on vaccines currently under development or in the pipeline and establish an abbreviated regulatory approval pathway for non-originator vaccines to support local manufacturing of vaccines support for COVID-19 by other vaccine manufacturers, thus scaling up their supplies. The Africa region creates a call for immediate global action coordinated by a strengthened WHO to ensure that COVID-19 diagnostics, treatments, and preventive products are made available to all member states and that all knowledge and inventions, including for medical devices, be treated as global public goods. On the IHRRC, we recognize, we recognize the efforts by the Secretariat in ensuring the impartial, independent, and comprehensive evaluation work of the Review Committee on the Functioning of the International Rate Health Regulations 2005 during the COVID-19 response, endorses its report and urge the full implementation of recommendations um, uh, contained therein. On mental health in COVID-19, we endorse the updated Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan 2013-2030 including the WHO Special Initiative for Mental Health. Given the need to support recovery from COVID-19, we request the Secretariat to support member states in promoting mental health and psychological, psychosocial well-being and strengthening preparedness, response capacity and resilience for future public health emergencies, taking into account context-specific solutions that support individual and local community mental health and well-being. In conclusion, the Africa region supports the adoption of the draft resolution introduced by the EU delegation on this agenda item. Chairperson, I thank you. Thank you, Zambia. I now give the floor to Bangladesh to be followed by Spain. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Bangladesh is delivering this statement on behalf of 11 member states in the Southeast Asia region. We appreciate WHO's contribution and leadership in global mental health initiative, particularly in Bangladesh and Nepal, to enhance access to inclusive, integrated, evidence-based primary and community mental health services and psychosocial support. It is a fact that mental health is still the most neglected and underinvested area across WHO program. We hope the EB 148 decision on promoting mental health preparedness and response for public health emergencies would pave the way for strengthening capacity of the member states on mental health preparedness and response to public health emergencies as highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 has exposed the existing mental health service gaps. In this respect, our region would like to make four points to address the existing and emerging challenges. First, Prioritization of mental health needs to be continued at all levels, global, regional, and national, to ensure an effective and comprehensive response to the mental health needs of people and healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the country level, integrated integration of mental health services into primary health care needs to be ensured to improve availability and accessibility of mental health care for all, especially those in vulnerable situations and her to reach areas. This also includes promoting deinstitutionalization towards community-led mental health services and cares. Moreover, the sustainable funding for addressing mental health problems needs to be available and adequate at all levels. In addition, culturally acceptable norms of mental health services should be developed, keeping in mind the needs, contexts, and priorities across regions. Second, 
Monitoring systems, including research, should be conducted to better understand the magnitude of problems, situation of unmet need, and utilization of services, as well as impacts to patients and family in the event of health emergencies. Third, mental health and community resilience should be extended through implementing an inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach involving different professions related to mental health in line with WHO's approach to mental health and psychosocial support. In addition, mental health literacy and awareness must be promoted to reduce misconceptions and stigma about mental health disorders, including in times of health emergencies. Also, adequate technical assistance should be provided for training and building capacity of the community health professionals and social workers on mental health, particularly in low and middle income countries. Finally, member states should be provided with adequate support for the implementation of the Global Mental Health Action Plan 2013-2013 in the context of public health emergencies. Thank you. Thank you, Bangladesh. I now give the floor to Spain to be followed by Portugal. Spain, you have the floor. Spain, we are not able to hear you. Can you come closer to your mic? Spain supports the statement made by the European Union uh, and supports the decision uh, to pr uh, promote uh, mental health preparedness for a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mental health has always been a priority for my country, uh, and uh, we've not lost sight of it uh, in the current crisis. Uh, we need to change the situation into an opportunity by laying the foundations for better mental health and more quality mental health service services after COVID. I'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to, to express the need to provide mental health support to mental uh, health uh, to uh, health uh, staff uh, that have gone through a period of extreme stress during the pandemic. Similarly, we want to recognize uh, the impact it's had on certain vulnerable groups that should not be left behind. Uh, we can say that Spain, thanks to the resilience of our health care system and universal health coverage, as well access to mental health, has not been interrupted significantly over this period. New demands have led to new modes of organization. And we've also been able to find new resources such as uh, remote uh, medical assistance and health assistance. Uh, we're working on a comprehensive approach to mental health, which is why we are updating our national strategy. Uh, we're working on the basis of consensus and cooperation. And for that, uh, we also count on the support of individuals uh, that uh, work with organizations. Uh, this update is in accordance with the recommendations that are included in the European Mental Health Action Plan. Thus it is that our new perspective is based on the rights of citizens, social integration, the, the fight against stigmatization, prevention of suicidal behaviors, and rehabilitation of individuals. We uh, believe that we are laying the foundations for a country to move forward with this paradigm shift. Uh, following the guidance of the World Health Organization. We know that this will be the start of better mental health care for all in the future after COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Spain. I now give the floor to Portugal to be followed by Denmark. Sure. Excellencies. I have the honor to address the 74th World Health Assembly on behalf of Portugal. We align ourselves with the previous statement made by the European Union. In the face of COVID-19 pandemic, we would like to congratulate the leading role of WHO and underscore the importance of preparedness, response, and recovery capacities to health emergencies, as well as ever-present need to build resilient health systems. Although we acknowledge gaps, which were previously clear, 
on the implementation of the international health regulations, we acknowledge member states for their commitment to multilateral cooperation and international solidarity in supporting countries and the work conducted by the WHO. As such, we highlight the importance of the Universal Health and Preparedness Review, a mechanism with the potential to successfully share policies, technical expertise, and best practices across member states and regions, supporting member states in their individual struggles to scale up preparedness, investment, and improvement. These core capacities should be considered a global public good, especially considering the health, economic, and social disruptions to countries and populations tricked by health emergencies. Share. We deem timely and necessarily to evaluate the experiences lived throughout the first year of pandemic to make sure health system as a whole come out more resilient. We acknowledge the importance of considering these lessons and call on all member states to strive for a global equitable cooperation and solidarity in accessing the right tools to fight the pandemic everywhere, as this is our own way to a strong recovery. We are committed to global health security through transparent, reliable, and timely communication in line with the guidance of WHO assuring global citizens their health and human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Portugal. I now give the floor to Denmark. Thank you, Jan. Denmark fully aligns itself with the statement made on behalf of the EU and its member states. This statement addresses agenda item 18 on mental health. A good mental health is vital in living life to the fullest and it cannot be taken for granted. We therefore welcome the updated comprehensive mental health action plan and the proposed decision. It is indeed important and vital to focus on mental health in a time of crisis, such as the current pandemic. COVID-19 itself, as well as supply restrictions and health measures, cause uncertainty and disruption to our everyday life and impact our mental health and well-being. These restrictions and disruptions can be especially challenging for those already struggling with anxiety, social exclusion or compulsive thoughts. We have to cope and manage the immediate consequences of the pandemic on mental health, but we must not neglect already existing conditions or abandon our focus once the pandemic is over. We need to apply the lessons learned from the last year and a half to our future response to health crisis and to a broader mental health management and organization. We must work to eliminate stigma and discrimination while also ensuring the same quality in care, prevention, early detection, treatment and rehabilitation, and follow up for all mental health disorders as is provided for people with physical illness. In Denmark, we have initiated the implementation of a 10-year mental health plan to address these problems. We need a united focus on mental health and we should use the current momentum to strengthen our efforts in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Denmark. I will now return the floor to our chair. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear delegates, the General Committee will take place today at 17.30, and we will therefore suspend the discussion on this group of items. 17, Public Health Emergency, Preparedness and Response, and 18, Mental Health Preparedness for and Response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will resume our discussion on these items at a later stage. When we reconvene tomorrow morning, we will open agenda item 11, proposed program budget 2022-2023 and item 12, World Health Organization Resource Framework, an update under pillar four, 
more effective and efficient World Health Organization, providing better support to countries. Please refer to the Daily Journal for full details. I thank you for your extensive intervention today. I wish you a nice rest of the day and look forward to our discussions tomorrow. This meeting is now closed. Recording stopped.